first Sunday in Advent, hear this word, reading first from the 25th Psalm, hear this word, to you, O Lord, I lift up my soul, O my God, I put my trust in you, do not let me be put to shame, do not let my enemies exult over me. Do not let those who wait for you be put to shame. Let them be ashamed who are wantonly treacherous. Make me to know your ways, O Lord. Teach me your paths. Lead me in your truth and teach me. For you are the God of my salvation. For you I wait all day long. Be mindful of your mercy, O Lord, and of your steadfast love for they have been from of old. Do not remember the sins of my youth or my transgressions according to your steadfast love. Remember me for your goodness sake, O Lord. Good and upright is the Lord. Therefore, he instructs sinners in the way. He leads the humble in what is right and teaches the humble his ways. All the paths of the Lord are steadfast love and faithfulness for those who keep his covenant and his decrees. And turning over, the second reading for this Sunday in Advent from the book of the prophet Jeremiah, hear this word from the 33rd chapter, beginning at the 14th verse. The days are surely coming, says the Lord, when I will fulfill the promise I made to the house of Israel and the house of Judah. In those days, at that time, I will cause a righteous branch to spring up for David, and he shall execute justice and righteousness in the land. In those days, Judah will be saved, and Jerusalem will live in safety. And this is the name by which it will be called. The Lord is our righteousness. The grass withers and the flower fades, but the word of God shall stand forever. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. Grant, O Lord, that we might be the masters of ourselves to become the servants of others. Take our minds and think through them. Take our lips and speak through them. Take our hearts and set them on fire for thee. Amen. Some of you no doubt know that in the eyes of the church, it is appropriate for me today to wish you Happy New Year this morning. Uh, that may sound odd, but it is uh, in the church calendar the very first Sunday of the liturgical church year, the first Sunday of Advent. Every year marks the beginning of a new religious calendar or liturgical calendar. And we don't talk about that very much, but it's significant in the sense that for centuries now, the church has had its own calendar and its own way of keeping time. The liturgical seasons form the, 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 the seasons of the church. Advent, Christmas, Epiphany, Lent, Easter, and Pentecost. And all of those were adopted early on by our ancestors as a way of saying, we may have the illusion that we're in control of time, but really God controls time. That's the whole purpose of the church calendar, to be the weekly reminder that God controls the calendar and the clock. And God uses time to do remarkable and surprising things in human life. Uh, when you think about it, the, the secular calendar basically tries to reduce the days to kind of numbers, one day after another. A, that's what the secular calendar is, a series of numbers. Today is 11, 27, 2016. Tomorrow, 11, 28, 2016. And on and on it goes. And that's certainly an accurate way to measure things. It's a little bit like the odometer clicking off miles on your car, but uh, it also makes it hard to see time as anything more than just kind of the same old, same old, you know? 
1126, click, 1127, click, 1128, click, one day after another. Though I do remember a couple years back now, I got a call on a late summer day, and, and uh, it was middle of the week, and it was a call from a, um, a, a bride and groom excited about uh, a secular date on the calendar. They, they called to ask if I would do a wedding on short notice. They said, we want to get married the following Monday. This coming Monday, could you do our wedding at 11 o'clock in the morning? And I said, well, let's visit about it. Why in the world do you want to get married 11 o'clock on a Monday morning? I don't think I've ever done a wedding for anybody at 11 o'clock on a Monday morning. And they said, well, we were having lunch, and we were discussing wedding dates, and we thought it would be so cool if we could be married on August 9th, 2010, at 11 in the morning. So our anniversary would be 8, 9, 10 at 11. And uh, so can you do that? Uh, we thought it's a unique date, never going to happen again. And I, I didn't have the heart to point out that, you know, there really would be no rush because they could get married 9, 10, 11, 12 uh, at, at, at uh, 1,300 hours. Uh, but, but I kept that to myself, just happy they were excited. And, uh, and I did the wedding. But, but it just, our culture tends to think of time, you know, like the odometer. It's, it's numerical. And the church has long seen the need to have its own vision of time and, and the deeper meaning behind it. Not just one day clicking off after another, but the series of holy seasons, holy days, each one steeped in a particular theme. And that, that calendar has meaning because the central thing is the reminder that God controls time. God's at work in your days, so they're not just one thing after another. And today, that's a long introduction, but today's the day to remind us ourselves that the holy calendar starts new with Advent and this great theme of the season of being watchful, waiting for God in anticipation that God's going to be at work in, in a surprising way in the world and in our lives, often in ways that we can't anticipate or expect. Uh, I like to do series sermons, uh, 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 sermon series for Advent, and this year I'm going to try to organize my own series uh, around the, the thinking about promises of Christmas. And in the Bible, of course, that whole concept of divine promise is so central. It goes all the way back to Genesis and the larger story of God coming to Abraham and Sarah, right, with this, with this amazing promise. Uh, you may remember how that played out. Uh, God comes to Abraham and to Sarah in their old age and says, I'm going to make a covenant with you, a commitment to you, a promise that you'll be parents of a son, and through that, uh, your, your offspring, they'll be as numerous as the stars. You're going to be the mother and father of a great nation. And, and with that unlikely promise from God, they get another pledge to go along with it. Uh, they, they're going to be shown a new land that's going to be given to them, a place for all these many descendants to call home, the, a promised land, uh, named that way, obviously enough, because it would represent the fulfillment of the pledge God is giving, the covenant God is making with Abraham and Sarah at that minute. So when you think about it, this whole concept of promise in the Bible starts off in, in what I think is just a delightful and wonderfully uplifting way. Uh, the promise of God in the Bible starts with God calling this ordinary and unlikely couple to what was sure to be for them an adventurous life, an interesting life, an exciting life. Even though on the surface of things, they didn't seem like the most promising candidates to live an adventurous, exciting, energized life. But that was what God said. No, you're going to do it. And I'm going to be with you, no matter your old age, no, no matter your declining health. God says to them, I've got this wondrous life and mission for you, and, and it's still out there ahead of you, and the key to finding it is simply to trust me, that I'll be true to what I promise you, that I'll be with you, and I'll hold you up. So you want excitement and energy, you want life to be more an adventure than just one day after another, step out and, and trust that I'll be true to what I've said. And it's not an accident, I would suggest to you, that every year as Advent starts, we get this, uh, the biblical readings point back to the promise, to the covenant, and say it's, it's still being fulfilled. And it's especially being fulfilled at Christmas time. 
Life is good, life can be an adventure, and God will still be coming in surprising ways in what may look like unpromising events and unpromising places. God's going to show up when you least expect it. Of course, we all know that here he comes in the manger in a cow barn out back of this ancient equivalent of the Motel 6 in Bethlehem. I mean, that's, that's what we're getting ready to do. This year, the reading to remind us about the, the promise and the fulfillment of the promise comes from Jeremiah. The days are coming saith the Lord, when I will fulfill the promise I made to the house of Israel, Abraham and Sarah, and the house of Judah, when your enslavement will end and the steadfast love of the Lord shall prevail. Do you know that that phrase, the steadfast love of God, the steadfast love, that's one of the most repeated phrases in the Bible. Uh, I counted up in my, uh, my, my little concordance, 180 times in the Old Testament alone, you get the phrase, the steadfast love of God. Three times in just that one Psalm, 25, which is another reading that goes along with this first Sunday. All the paths of the Lord, the psalmist says, all the paths are steadfast love and faithfulness for those who keep his covenant and his decrees. Give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. His steadfast love endures forever. There is a wonderful Hebrew word for what we translate in English, steadfast love. Uh, of God. The, the Hebrew word, and I don't pronounce my Hebrew very well, kesed is the Hebrew word, kesed. And, it's, and the, in Hebrew, it's the same root, kesed, is the same steadfast love, and also it's, it's, the, it's the root for our, your mother's womb, uh, which just underscores, you know, how strong and unshakable our ancestors experienced God's love to be. God's, like your mom, won't let you go, loves you no matter what. It's, it's utterly steadfast, doesn't depend on what you do. Uh, and up, in, up until the, the days of the Psalms in the 5th century B.C., people didn't tend to talk or think about steadfast love as being the primary quality of God's personality. I mean, if you read the ancient uh, uh, versions of other religions that were prominent in the 5th century B.C., most ancient religions picture God in, in not like a mom holding on to, for dear life to a child she loves, but kind of this you know, stern, easily angered, and, you know, usually a, a male figure uh, kind of looking for flaws and, and uh, you know, not, not eager to take any uh, uh, malfeasance from any of God's creations. Uh, and I think for many people, they still think of God in that way. God's more interested in flaws and God's more easily angered than, than willing to love us. Uh, Anne Lamott, in, uh, who's a really good contemporary spiritual writer, in one of her books, describes how, as a young person, she always thought of God as being like the grouchy high school principal who spent his time rummaging through my permanent file, never liking what he found there. I, you know, that's A lot of people think of God. A more eloquent uh, but similar idea uh, was uh, talked about by uh, Henry Louis Gates. You know, Henry Louis Gates uh, teaches African-American studies at Harvard, and uh, he wrote a, a memoir and describes his early experience in the church uh, in, in, a, in a good book entitled Colored People. He talked about sitting in church as a little boy with his family, trying to imagine what heaven was like. And he says this in his book, it dawned on me at an early age that sitting up in heaven with angry Miss Sarah, my Sunday school teacher, or snarling Reverend Moore for that many years was about as appealing as getting a typhoid shot in my backside every day. Uh, I suppose the shakeup of my spiritual creed was hastened by my realization that I was religious in part because I was scared. Scared of Jesus coming back to earth and sending me to hell, scared of being liquidated or vaporized in some kind of spiritual nuclear holocaust. Uh, that's a pretty extreme way to say it, but, but for many people, God is seen more as fearful than all the ways of the Lord, the psalmist says. All the ways are steadfast loves. And I think it can take a lifetime for some people to recover from those early images that sometimes the church is taught about the fearsomeness of God. Some people never do. I mean, they, they just leave the church and take up golf on Sunday morning or, or, or some other, you know, a pursuit and ne never get to it, assuming that what the church really has to offer is more bad news than it is good news uh, as we advertise it. So uh, that, that's not to say that 
we don't all, at some level, whether we're overtly religious or not, uh, want a sense of acceptance by the, at the heart of reality, want a sense that we are cared about and loved by a love that's deeper than our own. I think that never goes away, whether we, uh, whether we find our way to church or not. I, I, it remind, there's a wonderful story uh, that Ernest Hemingway, uh, Hemingway wrote about once. Hemingway, you know, uh, had an upbringing that was uh, characterized by a lot of parental rejection, and certainly he, he had an absence of steadfast love in his life from the people he cared about. And he wrote once uh, this story about the Spanish father who decides uh, he wants to reconcile with a son of his who had run away to Madrid, and he hadn't heard from this son for years. And, and the story goes that the father took out an ad in the Madrid newspaper that read, a little classified, Paco, meet me at Hotel Montana at noon on Tuesday. All is forgiven, Papa. And uh, Paco, of course, a very common name in Spain. And when the father gets to the square in front of the Hotel Montana at noon the next day, there's like 800 Pacos <laughs> waiting for their fathers to receive their welcome home. Uh, on the first Sunday of Advent, every year, we are reminded that we're all Pacos in one way or another. You know, we are in need of some sort of reconciliation. And for us, Jeremiah says, the news is good. The news is good. Uh, God's love is steadfast. He waits for each one of us to make our way to the hotel plaza, so to speak, to welcome us back. His steadfast love endures forever. Uh, how far does that love go? How steadfast is the steadfast love of God? I find myself asking that question sometimes when I am called upon to officiate at funerals for people who've had no interest in religion or faith in their life. And even once in a while, I, I, on rare occasions, I do funerals for people who are not only indifferent to religion, but they were like atheists. They just didn't believe it. Uh, and, and inter you, you only get asked to do a funeral for an atheist by, uh, w when they have kids that are, are faithful people and they want the comfort of their faith, but they say, you know, we, you know respect, we know dad wasn't a believer and in fact thought it was not meaningful, but, but we, we, would you do the funeral? And, and I've always kind of been slightly conflicted, but also it, it raises that question, how far does the steadfast love of God go? I, I, I find myself asking in those circumstances, do I have a right to do this, to stand over somebody at their death and proclaim a faith that they themselves rejected? And the answer is, at least the answer that I tell myself is, I dare to think that grace, you know, which God intends for the salvation of all humanity, that God's grace is not so fragile that it can't stand up to anything. Even, you know, human disbelief does not negate God's goodness. And, and surely a God who is willing to stoop down to us at uh, Christmas time and come in the form of a vulnerable infant is both too loving and too gracious and, and also too wise to take our rebellious rejection for a final answer. That's, you know, even when we abandon God, God doesn't abandon us. His steadfast love, all the ways of the Lord are steadfast. That's what I believe to be true. And, and the beginning of Advent is the time to remember that that, that that invitation to come home is there for all of us. I read somewhere that uh, in Florence, Italy, there is a historical building called the Foundling Hospital. This hospital was built in 1419, and it was established basically to be a, uh, a haven for abandoned infants. Uh, in the desperate days of the Middle Ages when the hospital was built, it was fairly common for especially poor residents of Florence, if they had too many children, they'd just decide which one they, they, they had to decide, how many we, can we care for. And, uh, the Foundling Hospital became an early orphanage in the late Middle Ages in Italy. Uh, students of architecture come from all over the world to see the Foundling Hospital because it's beautiful, it's ornate, it's got these wonderful frescoes. But the, the most interesting feature of the building, uh, and you can see it online, is something called the rota. Uh, it's kind of a large, lazy Susan device beside the hospital's main entry. And the, the way it worked was like this. A mother who could no longer care for her baby, instead of depositing it on a street corner would, and walk away and you know, hope for the, you know, abandon it to the kindness of strangers, so to speak, they would bring the infant to the foundling hospital and they would place the baby on the 
Lazy Susan, the rota, and, and, and ring a bell, and then turn the, turn the, 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 the Lazy Susan, and uh, on, in, in the door the child would go. A nurse on the other side would open the door, and the baby disappeared into the care of the institution. And nowadays, as I read about it, there's a museum in the hospital, and there is a display of some of the ancient blankets in which the infants were wrapped when they were placed on the rota. And the, the practice uh, next to them, uh, the, the blankets, you, there is a series of, of ribbons and little buttons and medals, all of which are, are cut in half, or, or they're, they're in fragments. And they were attached to the blanket, like a little fragment of a ribbon. And, and the way that it worked was that, that half of a ribbon would be placed on the blanket, or a button, or half of a little piece of jewelry would be pinned to the, the blanket and the mother would keep the other half uh, with, with the er earnest hope that if things improved and she was able to, she could come back at a later day and claim, this is, here's the other half of that ribbon, this is my child. Uh, it was one of the ways in which that connection was maintained and, uh, and, and that, that love that would come back to reclaim the child would be still maintained. And Advent strikes me, it, it's, it's like God coming back with that half of the ribbon that we've been holding on to saying, yeah, you, here's your identity. Uh, I, I am yours and you are mine. And Advent every year begins with this idea that even in moments when we feel abandoned by life, God's return is just ahead. You know, lift up your heads, the, the ancient readings say, and keep your trust level high. Because Advent's really more than a symbol. It, it is really the extension of the promise of God's steadfast love in, in the form uh, of a surprising Bethlehem baby. Uh, Jesus Christ is his name. We look now, whatever distance has been set this past year between us and God, we look forward to that return with eager hope and our waiting with loving hearts begins now. Thanks be to God. Amen.